About rauha two years ago, I did the two Superman Batman videos on public enemies and Supergirl slash apocalypse. And seeing how I never eventually got back to covering Injustice past the first game, with how Supergirl was introduced in those follow-ups, doing this video will be the next best thing for a few checked boxes. Obviously, Supergirl is one of them, and her characterization past her introduction in that Superman Batman story was, according to some comments I got in that latter video, messed up to the point I'm surprised I never got down to document it. Still, I'm going to postpone that in favor of this other story, that among the pre-New 52 DC animated original movie universe films, is seen as an unofficial sequel to that last movie with Supergirl in it. Superman Unbound, which is based on the Superman Brainiac storyline from Jeff Johns Action Comics run. It was set after the year one later time skip following Infinite Crisis, after Superman had gotten his powers back from fighting Superboy Prime through a red sun. Jeff Johns also brought Richard Donner to co-write the reintroduction of the true Terran stamp inspired General Zod and the introduction of Krisken, aka Lord Zod, General Zod's son that Superman and Lois briefly adopted as their son. But if this is the first time you hear about Krisken, then you can probably imagine how he has ended up. Spoilers, it's better than what Tom Taylor has done to John Kent. Then Bizarro and the Legion of Superheroes were changed to be their classic versions again, from what the post crisis had reimagined them as, with Toyman also being made Winslow shot once more, which so also made Hiro Okamura, the Japanese Toyman from Public Enemies, to be turned into a robot created by Shot. Jeff Johns was pretty much trying to make classic Silver Age modern in his own way of fixing things, which you can imagine included a lot of retconning things. And in this story it was Brainiac's turn. Also, in coming back to Supergirl's inclusion in this, as it was brought up in those comments I showcased, most of Supergirl's history was muddled and on its way to be course corrected after this story when Sterling Gates took over her comic series. I got most of that information to share from Robert Willing, who went through this comic with me and overall helped me get this opening written, so early thanks to him for all of that as well. Okay, that should be enough opening introduction to this story. Sorry, so let's begin already. In a not so distant past on the still existing planet Krypton, the populace of the city of Kandor is being slaughtered by alien robots coming from a skull ship in the sky, while the defense forces led by General Zahn barely get anything done. Eventually, one last drone lands in the middle of Kandor and raises a force field, separating the city with its inhabitants from the rest of Krypton, and ends up leaving a huge crater in its place. 35 years later. In a staff meeting at the Daily Planet building, Jimmy Olsen arrives late with drinks and snacks for everyone as a framing device to introduce Cat Grant, Steve Lombard, and Ron Troop into the story, and in story to reintroduce Lois, Clark, and Jimmy to them. Cat and Steve get their establishing character moments with the latter as a dad bodied sports news editor and the former, as Clark explains later to Lois, as a mourning mother trying to hide that she is not over her son's death. And that cat, this is her big return after being in LA for so long after the death of her son in the 90s. Yeah. Which, this is meant to imply that her time in LA changed her for the worse, not the better. Including getting um, a boob job. After that meeting is over, Clark hears a report about something falling to Earth from space and leaves to respond to it as Superman. That something turns out to be a voiceless Brainiac drone that engages him in combat, while also drawing blood to analyze, and then shuts itself down after confirming that Superman is a Kryptonian. Meanwhile, far away in the deep vastness of space, the skull ship from the opening is shown reacting to the report of having found a Kryptonian after 241 previous failed attempts. But this then ends up being another failure because the report didn't include the coordinates. 
Back on Earth, Superman has taken the Brainiac robot to the forces of solitude, where Supergirl accompanying him confirms that the robot is not Brainiac, and that Superman has in truth never actually met Brainiac. Every previous encounter has been probes that developed advanced artificial intelligences and went rogue. The true Brainiac, as Kara remembers from growing up on Krypton, is what she had lived through in the opening prologue before she was sent after baby Kal El by her father Zorel. Reliving Brainiac's invasion, as she tells Clark about it, causes Kara to use her heat vision to destroy the probe robot, while she also narrates her horror experience to him, which naturally causes Clark to try comforting her. Kara's floodgates are still already open, and she so keeps pouring her emotions about Kandor's possible abduction, and how she was sent to look after her baby cousin. But as her rocket was caught in suspended animation, she is now looked after by the grown-up Clark, who unlike Kara, has no people to remember, miss or nightmares to fear over. In the next scene, Clark is talking with his parents about Kara's mention of Kandor, and how there could be thousands of Kryptonians out there at Brainiac's mercy. Ma Kent has a bad feeling about it, while Pa Kent asks Clark about Brainiac looking for him, to which Clark adds that he has managed to use the Fortress's Sunstone Crystals to reverse engineer the probe robot's guidance system and retrace its route back to Brainiac. Essentially Actually, this visit to the Kent farm is for Clark to see his parents before leaving to space, with Pa Kent giving him proper encouraging words with physical evidence from Clark's childhood how he is more than capable of dealing with whatever Brainiac might throw at him. Before leaving, Clark creates physical memento of gratitude to Pa Kent for this confidence boost. And then in the next scene, Clark is at work talking to Lois about what Kara told him about Brainiac and about Krypton. Especially that he just knows facts about Krypton, but has no memories or experiences from there like Kara has, and that she has been spending most of her time as Supergirl without trying to integrate into the humanity with a secret identity. And then we get a workplace incident when Steve Lombard keeps throwing football around the office cubicles, which causes Lois to ask Clark to hurry up with his space journey and get back before Lombard antagonizes someone in the planet's staff to throw him off the roof. Later, when Superman is retracing the probe's flight path, he also listens to General Zahn's old account of Brainiac's invasion and what happened to Kandor, as well as some related accounts to Jor-El's discoveries of Krypton's destruction that he doesn't get to hear before the file ends, and his ship arrives to an alien planet that Brainiac is attacking. So naturally, Superman Superman charges to tear the probe robots apart in trying to defend the aliens in order to get Brainiac's attention, but that only leads to him getting hit back and being forced to watch as the alien city is isolated into a force field, while Brainiac's ship fires a missile at the nearby sun to cause its escalation into a red giant and so destroy the unfortunate planet. Superman is also caught in the blast and so left vulnerable for Brainiac to collect on onto his ship. Meanwhile on Earth, Kara, who was not told of where Clark went, comes to ask about his whereabouts at Daily Planet as Supergirl, at the same time when Cat Grant is making a clear effort into looking good while doing her job as a gossip reporter. So Supergirl's sudden appearance causes Cat Sims to turn their male gazes at her. And the situation almost gets worse when Supergirl's X-ray vision passively notices Kat's breast implants to confuse her. But Lois then appears to pull Kara away from receiving Kat's scorn for the accidentally innocent embarrassment she caused. In the privacy of the planet's rooftop, Kara asks Lois where her cousin has disappeared to, with the next scene showing him be orally prone by Brainiac's robots on his ship. The Rose causes Superman to get visions of what Brainiac has been doing to different alien worlds, which causes him to wake up and fight himself free to discover everyone else also trapped inside the ship. After forced to defend himself against another prisoner, 
Superman makes his way deeper into the ship to find multiple bottled cities with Kandor among them as Kara believed it to be. But then Kandor is ripped out of his reach, and Superman is then brought face to face with the true form of Brainiac, who seems to be adapting his physical strength to balance with his intellect to just tank everything Superman throws at him while making passive commentary about his prime directive. AKA the fact that he collects bottle cities as samples of information and destroys the original worlds to make the collected information unique. Then in the middle, here we have a scene from the Kent farm where Ma and Pa can see birds falling from the sky, while Brainiac keeps passively roasting Superman for his inferiority and beating him up, but also revealing that the earlier probing his robots did to Superman have revealed from his mind to Brainiac where Earth is, that they have already arrived to Earth which will be assimilated into his collection, and that like Superman, Supergirl will be taken into the same processing he went through. And around the same time as Lois and Kara are continuing their discussion on where Clark has gone and the Daily Planet staff is busy doing their jobs, Brainiac ship appears above Metropolis to cause chaos, panic and pandemonium. With Kara naturally falling into PTSD in seeing Brainiac ship in the sky before the probe robots are launched around the city to attack people, and Supergirl in trying to face her fears charges at them to protect Lois so she can run for safety. In the skull ship, Brainiac is passively telling the struggling Superman that he is pretty much going to do to him, Earth and Kara what Cell did in Dragon Ball Z. You will soon be a part of something far, far greater than you can possibly realize. What do you mean? You will be absorbed into... perfection. Having probably watched the Cell Saga at some point of his life, Superman fights back in horror and uses that one method Goku used to fight against Frieza on Namek. <laughs> And that appears to be the first critical damage Superman manages to deliver to Brainiac in breaking his ability to tank. So he then manages to punch Brainiac down for the count, before going to look for Kandor again. When finding it, Superman is contacted from inside it by Zor-El and Alra. Kara's parents, who had repurposed some of Brainiac's technology that General Zaz Force has managed to recover to save Argo City from Krypton's destruction, which had unfortunately summoned Brainiac back to them when he sensed his technology being used and slaughtered its citizens in assimilating it to his ship. That is where Kara had been sent to Earth from after her cousin as seen in the Superman Batman comic. But by this point, Brainiac has gotten himself back up to restrain Superman once again, and have his ship collect Supergirl on board while also isolating Metropolis into a bottle in his collection. And then to make this already bad situation worse, Brainiac fires on another missile at the sun to escalate it to turn into a red giant to consume Earth, just like with what happened to that previously seen alien world and to Krypton. Was this one of those other retcons that, that would have tied Brainiac into uh, Krypton's from what I understand, he normally does that with other planets. It's what the least we to think that, but then he later revealed um, Krypton was doomed anyway. So, because otherwise, because look what happened. He sends the missile out, it caused an instantaneous detonation. Here, so in the case of Kandor and Krypton still had a good couple of years left. So it's basically a case where he came by, scooped him up, but he knew they're going to die. It's going to die anyway. I don't need to do anything. Hmm. Then to add insult to injury, Brainiac ends up deeming Earth technologically and culturally irrelevant to be added to his collection, while questioning Superman why he even bothers with them. That insult, along with hearing Lois and the rest of Metropolis calling out to him, then empowers Superman to free himself from his restraints, and show Brainiac that he is a combat pragmatist in knowing when to use brute force against his opponents. With Brainiac on the 
ground again. Superman grabs the bottled cities holding Metropolis and Candor, while promising to come back for the others, before rushing to save Supergirl from the robots to do her what they did to him, and as Brainiac has once again recovered to come for them again. Superman tells Supergirl what the situation is, and that she needs to stop the missile from reaching the sun to save Earth, while he has to get a third round against the approaching Brainiac. While Kara is afraid with her PTSD, Clark tells her that it's okay, because courage is about being afraid and doing what you need to do anyway. With that added confidence, Supergirl charges after the missile as Brainiac menacingly approaches Superman, who this time is ready to fight smarter by countering his attacks, and properly uses his powers to drag Brainiac outside of his ship to fall down to a bog somewhere on Earth. Essentially outside of his sterile safe space, Brainiac is now exposed to bacteria, microscopic organisms, and other forms of life for the first time that he cannot control. And that is how Superman ultimately manages to bring him down. Then immediately, as the bottled cities outside of Brainiac's ship are not connected to it anymore, start growing back to their original sizes, so Superman has to hurry in returning Metropolis to its place and find a spot for Kandor to be restored. Brainiac still as a sore loser, remotely fires at another missile from his ship that goes ignored by Superman as he is more focused with the restoration of Metropolis. It ends up costing him as while he is flying Kandor to an isolated location, the missile is fired at Kent Farm, where Fa Kent manages to push Ma Kent out of the line of fire, while Supergirl manages to deal with the previous missile. And while Supergirl is in space, with Superman somewhere in the Arctic witnessing Kandor's restoration, the physical stress of surviving that attack causes Spa Kent to suffer a heart attack, with Clark not being able to hear his mother calling out to him over the noise Kandor is making. And when the noise stops, it's far too late for Superman to react anymore, as the story ends with him arriving to his childhood home to embrace his mourning mother and passed away father. Let's start with the obvious elephant we have in the room. Gary Frank is one of Jeff Johns' go-to artists, and seeing how Johns had co-written most of his action comics run with Red Card Donner, Superman, Clark Kent and Lois Lane are obviously drawn to resemble Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder, with Supergirl also being made to look like Laura Vanderwart from Smallville, which was on the air at the time the story came out. That then also ended up giving the other characters some unique and diverse faces not to make them come across as random NPCs, but also made me see Brainiac with the same face that Gary Frank would later draw onto Lex Luthor in Superman's Secret Origin story. Otherwise, Gary Frank is not a bad artist, and his art has definitely improved since after he did this story. Now to comment on how the story was told. Jeff John's reinvention of Brainiac, from the artificial intelligence that most people know from Superman the Animated Series, made him become a biological alien entity once again, and the collector of worlds that he had been originally created as in the Silver Age. Although not as a silly version, but rather as a malicious force of nature that Superman was shown to have a pure hatred and disgust for. Otherwise, Brainiac is no different from his previous robot slash AI forms, as he was still collecting bottled cities. So, from a certain point of view, Jeff Johns did to Brainiac pretty much the same thing as the archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics did when they had to address changing Dr. Robotnik's name to Dr. Eggman. Long story to explain that, but it also included turning him into a robot and then being turned organic again.
Then to address Supergirl's involvement in this story, looking back and forth between it and her debut story, not much would be needed to acknowledge from what happened in between then and now. So I could understand where the fringe logic connection between the two movie adaptations actually comes from, meaning that this story somewhat rewinded her characterization backwards from what happened in her own series, and in going forward from here in giving Supergirl a new chance to be redone when Sterling Gates took over. And I will probably do a read through stream in going through her series at some point to get a better documentation on how bad it actually was. Finally, before going to rewatch Superman Unbound, I still need to address the death of Parkin. Now, I can only assume that this was done because Jeff Johns had re-established Superman's lore to match up with the Richard Donner films, and the Pa Kent died to a heart attack like this in the 1978 movie. Pa Kent stayed dead in the comics up to the New 52, where Grant Morrison had both of Superman's parents be dead from a car crash as the status quo, up until it took Dr. Manhattan in Doomsday Clock about a decade later to litter retcon them back to life. That kind of came to a full circle with Jeff Johns writing it, so in a funny way, he giveth back what he originally took away. I then have more to say about the story along with the elevated roles of the Daily Planet staff, but that would be better done when also talking about the animated movie, so let's move onward with it. Okay, let's start with a few obvious things I need to get out of the way. General Zod is not included in the movie's opening, Cat Grant is included, but she doesn't have a voice actor, same thing with Parkin, and he doesn't die, Steve Lombard is turned into a flanderized lawsuit waiting to happen, Clark and Lois are not married, this is made to be Superman's first confrontation with Brainiac in learning about his existence, and I think this movie unnecessarily padded the story in probably feeling that it was too short. Unlike Joe Kelly with Superman Bay as the Elite and Jude Winnick with Under the Red Hood, Jeff Johns was not included with it, just like how he wasn't with any other adaptations of his stories, and the screenplay was instead written by some guy named Bob Goodman. With that being said, I should probably also acknowledge the fact that the premise of Superman Brainiac has been rehashed more times than once after it first came out. First by Grant Morrison in Hanen Neo 52 action comics run, and then also in the Superman 78 comic series. Both of those stories had Brainiac debut like in this story, and either introduced the bottle city of Kandor, or had Metropolis be put into a bottle. That being said, Superman Brainiac was more or less a story idea on how to introduce Brainiac as a Superman villain, so the adaptation with Superman Unbound could end up being seen as a retelling in the form of Brainiac's debut. That way, it could also be an original story with broad strokes that either work or don't work, and that is why the premise has been retold or remade a couple of times. I already listed out a few changes at the opening of this segment, so I might as well dive a little deeper into them. So the opening in the comic is replaced with a Lois Lane is a hostage situation that introduces Supergirl to the audience, and her issues that she opens up to Superman after Brainiac's probe has landed, before it even lands. That, on one hand, introduces Supergirl earlier into the story, but on the other hand, this rearranging of scenes causes some missed opportunities when it comes to her characterization. For example, 
even if this was a standalone movie and Superman Batman Apocalypse was not a previous installment, it would have been better to showcase that Kara retained the positive attitude she had at the end of that movie and then have it break into the PTSD driven characterization in the comic after she has seen Brainiac's probe robot, which could have then caused her mood to swing. Then there is Superman's and by the extension Clark Kent's characterization along with his relationship with Lois Lane. As I said previously, they are not married here like in the comic, but rather in a secret-ish office relationship, which is done to add some parallel between Superman and Brainiac in having Clark come across as he was controlling Lois in hiding their relationship, similar to how Brainiac is holding the bottle city under his control. And that is a your mileage may vary issue, as in, this seems like an intentionally made change in seeing how Superman in the main story was something of a flat character, who needed more character arc than just possibly finding more of his people and becoming aggressive in seeing how Brainiac treated those weaker than them both. They succeeded in that, but at the cost of the first impressions on Superman when he is introduced into the movie, both as Superman and later as Clark Kent. Speaking of which, Ma and Pa Kent are included in the movie as guardians for Kara living in the Kent farm in Smallville, and Clark is never shown interacting with them. Whereas in the comic, Clark told both his parents and Lois, but not to Kara, that he was going to head out to space after Brainiac. In the movie he tells Lois and Kara, while not letting his parents know where he is going. And before moving on to Brainiac's portrayal, let's talk about the Daily Planet staff. Steve Lombard, as I previously said, has been flanderized into a walking lawsuit waiting to happen, and also had his few heroic qualities adapted out by changing him to cower from Brainiac's robots, to be saved by Lois, whereas he and Ron saved Cat from the same situation in the comic. Cat Grant is then pretty much a non-entity, as a background character who doesn't even have a voice actor. I suppose that might have had something to do with Bob Goodman and the others working on the movie, not being able to see past the facade of a morning mother and just saw Cat as the cougar that most people too lazy to read did. Jimmy Olsen also has a moment to shine when Lois has him use his signal watch to call Supergirl the roof of the Daily Planet building, because the movie movie waited her coming there earlier just as a nod to the same scene from the comic. Okay, and now we can talk about Brainiac's portrayal, which is not much different from the comic, although I am not sure if John Noble's voice was the one I would have initially imagined hearing from reading this dialogue. I did not destroy Krypton after uploading my specimens, because the planet was about to destroy itself. Then the movie seemed to have been extended to reach the wanted runtime, by having Superman end up getting miniaturized into Kandor and meet Kara's parents in person, then escape from there with Brainiac's teleporting robots, I found this part ingenious in showcasing Superman's combat intelligence, and imprison Brainiac into his cocoon while escaping from his scholarship. This did not happen in the comic, and Superman was imprisoned inside the ship while Brainiac had already made his way to Earth and put Metropolis into a bottle. Not to mention while escaping Brainiac's ship, Superman does damage to it in attempting to slow Brainiac down, but could also be unintentionally compromising the life support systems needed to sustain the bottle cities in the ship. What the hell is wrong with you? And so the comic's plot is stretched longer by having Superman flee with Kandor to Earth, show it to Kara along with her parents in the Fortress of Solitude before Brainiac reaches Earth, fight against the robots with Supergirl before Metropolis is put into a bottle, and that is the filler we got to reach 75 minutes runtime. So, when Superman is recaptured and put where he was at this point of the comic, we get this scene. Your sentimental attachment is grotesque. Even you must realize how worthless they are. Such a savage world. 
Its scientific achievements paltry, its weapons unimpressive. I have two different opinions about this part. On one hand, yes, this is the movie's signature scene that the movie is most known for. However, when I have to compare the two situations from both the comic and the animated movie, we have a clearly desperate situation where Brainiac has Metropolis added to his collection of bottled cities, Superman is held in restraints, Supergirl is out of commission, Sun has been fired at with a missile that can turn it into a red giant to consume Earth, and Brainiac Brainiac is talking down on Superman while dismissing Earth as disgusting. In the comic, Superman hears Lois's voice among the people trapped inside the bottled cities, which all combined coerce him to break free from Brainiac's bindings and fought to get Metropolis and Kandor before going to kill Supergirl. In the movie, Superman just frees himself as if he could have done it all along, and just decided to do it after Brainiac had insulted Earth and humanity. Then when it comes to Lois being shown as if she was calmly waiting for that to happen, and then flipping Brainiac off before it did... Okay, Superman will always save Lois Lane. There is no stakes then. That's just really crappy writing. If I ever have a situation where I'm depicting something dangerous and the audience just doesn't care because they know what's going to happen, I failed as a writer at that point. Pretty much as Jared said there, the stakes and the tension of this desperate situation is deflated when the people in danger are shown to be waiting to be rescued. Cool scene on its own for meme purposes, but when I have to acknowledge it within the context of the movie around it, seeing Superman break himself free goes from being a hell yeah moment to a what the kiss moment. After that, the minor differences are that Supergirl is not given the same it's okay to be afraid encouragement, because Lois apparently gave it to her instead earlier, before going to stop the missile from hitting the sun, Brainiac being reduced in his fight with Superman into the equivalent of a black box, without getting a chance to take out the Kent farm as a petty last move, Candor being restored to its regular size on some alien planet to bait a sequel that never happened along with Brainiac's black box, and then there is a public marriage proposal between Lois and Clark before the credits roll. Fun fact by the way, I have collected scans to do this kind of video with the death of Superman, and that exact thing happened because they had gotten engaged in the first place, and could not get married in the comics before the Lois and Clark TV showed it at first. But back to comparing these two things, while Superman Brainiac is clearly the better version of the story with better art, story structure and character arcs that set the stage for stories that came after it, Superman Unbound had some strong suits such as the cast of Matt Boomer as Superman, So what's your excuse? You volunteered to be their hostage? Stana Katik as Lois Lane, Other reporters don't have the access I do. Molly Quinn as Supergirl, Calls itself Brainiac. We were in Candor, visiting friends when those things attacked. And the aforementioned John Noble as Brainiac. I have been claiming worlds for centuries before you were born. You thought it would help you to disconnect me from my ship. You failed to comprehend. This ship is me. Constructed around me. An extension of me. Of which I am still somewhat unsure if he was directed to do his performance the right way, or if his dialogue was written properly. Without getting a sequel to it due to low sales on DVDs, it however still has that feeling of what could have come after it with different changes made into it from the comic. And so it's ultimately left as the first and earliest retelling of Superman Brainiac, followed by Grant Morrison's New 52 action comics run, Superman 78 comic, and before Henry Cavill was sent to do Warhammer 4K for Amazon, there were fan speculations to make his next Man of Steel movie based on Superman Brainiac. And in going forward, my next comic book adaptation comparison review should so far include For the Man Who Has Everything, The Death of Superman, and Crisis on Infinite Earths divided into three parts. 
Until those projects get into production, remember to like this video, comment something about it down below, share this video for more people to see, and subscribe to the channel to be alert when the videos are coming. Also, ding the bell to be alerted for when I'm doing gaming streams, for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.